Okay. Hey, everybody. Microsoft Medics, the doctors are in, and we are ready to uh, take audience questions regarding Dynamics uh, 365. Today we have a great panel um, gathered. So let's introduce everybody. Chris, I know you're hiding in the background there. Sure. Hi, everybody. A little under the weather today, but didn't want to miss out supporting my fellow MVP experts as well as the audience. Uh, my name is Chris Cognetta. I'm director for the CRM practice at TriBridge. Uh, I've been an MVP for about six years now and uh, enjoy uh, infrastructure and architecture. So and I like seeing all the stuff coming together for Dynamics 365. Great. Uh, Scott? Hey, everyone. Uh, good to see you. Um, I'm not wearing my medics coat. I feel I feel as though Gustav has really shown us everyone up by, <laughs> by wearing the medics coat. Um, so uh, I have got one somewhere, but you know I'm not going to go and get it. Um, so I'm a solution architect. I'm also the author of the Ribbon Workbench um, and Spark XRM, and I've been an MVP uh, for about four years now. It seems to time flies when you're having fun, um, and I am. I generally help clients with technical solutions, uh, but it's all about the whole stack these days. So I've recently attended a SharePoint conference, so my, my uh, horizons are expanding. So anyway, it's good to be here. Great. And Scott, you are the author of the Ribbon Workbench as well. Yeah. Yeah, I am. That we've all come to know and love. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry. Hey, Jerry. Well, thank you very much. Um, Jerry Weinstock with Serum Innovation here in Kansas. It is going to be 70 degrees again for like the fourth day in a row, so there is some small upside to global warming, but we won't go there either. Um, <laughs> right, Donna? Thank you. Yeah. Um, I've been doing CRM since I saw the launch of the of, of the product of 1. version 1.2 back in early 2003, so been around for a while, love all the different versions, love the progress we've made. I think the entire platform and the whole process of customer relationship management is going through a major change event this year. And it's uh, great to be part of this group to answer any questions. Wonderful. Hey, Gustav, how are you doing? Great, yeah. Um, my name is Gustav Westerman, and I'm a five-year MVP. I've been uh, I'm working as a solution architect, trying to help my customers with uh, getting a, a good solution with the Dynamics, Dynamics 365. And I've uh, been working with CRM since 1.2. Uh, I actually have a, a project now with, with uh, migrating that first solution I've been doing from uh, 1.2, which is really fun, doing that, um, going back to the old days of 1.2. Um, but otherwise, I really love working with the new version. And uh, actually, uh, did a demo now with uh, almost just working with the mobile client. And uh, it's I really like that. If you haven't tried it out, you should really try the new mobile client. And actually, just using the mobile client even through, through Windows is a really great experience. I really like that. That's awesome. So Donna here, you guys know me. I've uh, been around the block for, for a, a, a few times here. Um, uh, but I've been working with CRM for a long time, now known as Dynamics 365. Um, long, long time. And, you know, since version 1.2 or something. And I am really happy to be able to have the opportunity to host these Microsoft Medics 365 calls. The primary purpose of the call is uh, to help people resolve any issues that they're having, answer questions, um, and, uh, you know, just be here in general to talk about all things Dynamics 365. Uh, I did not mute the audience today, so if you'd like to ask a question, feel free to interrupt at any time and ask that, or you can post your questions in the chat if you're more comfortable with that. And we will take those questions and respond to them. 
when we don't have questions to respond to, we're going to talk about the things that we like to talk about <laughs> with regard to Dynamics uh, 365. And today, a few of those items, although we're not just completely restricted to these items, a few of the things that we want to talk about uh, are Common Data Service, Power Apps, and Flow. So I picked those subjects because I'm hearing a lot of discussion in the community, especially around common data, common data uh, service, aka common data model, depending upon who you are and who's talking about it. But I know that Scott Duro was heavily involved in that in the beginning, so I'm really happy to have him in our session. And Jerry has done quite a little bit of work, I believe, with either Flow and or Apps, or both. And Gustav is our all-around expert on all things. So, so it's, it's good to have him because when we have questions about any of these things, as well as any other Dynamics 365 things, Gustav is going to be able to you know, ensure that we get uh, the correct information out to the audience. So welcome, everybody. Um, since we don't have any questions right now, why don't we jump right into Common Data Service? So my first question out is, is it called Common, I'm just going to ask an easy question here. So is it called Common Data Service or is it Common Data Model or is it both? You know, can so we... Common, yeah, Common Data Service is effectively the name of the whole suite, it's the platform. Um, so the common data model is just simply part of that, um, and it's, it's namely the, the part of the, the, the platform that allows you to define your schema, your entities, and your attributes. So um, I, I, I think a lot of people make a quite a big deal out of the differential, but really it's just um, it's the same thing. Um, you know, it, 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 but the common data model is usually referred to as the entity structure, so it's your database structure effectively. Yeah, and Again, I services is, is what you are interacting with. Sure, and that makes total sense. You know, I think that I think that in some people's mind they think about the model exactly what you said, you know, it's the entities, the metadata, right? That schema, you know, the, the, the that part of the structure that you're working with. Um, when we think about service in general, when we think about services in general, we usually think about like the API and those types of services. You know, it's going to exchange the data, but I think that with this with this um, component, it's a little bit different. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, that? yeah, definitely. And I think one of the key positionings of uh, CDS is that it, it is a service that can be consumed by lots of different parts of your overall enterprise, and th and I think that's the real differentiator. Of, of CDS against many other places, many other um, services or applications, in that quite often we're talking about things like dynamics as a, um, you know, you've got sales and you've got marketing, you've got very, it's very much line of business orientated, uh, whereas CDS is, is really trying to be a service at the center of all of those things to enable you to interchange, exchange data um, and interact with each other. Um, so, a lot of people question how does CDS or CDM affect my database in CRM um, and Dynamics 365 and, and, and the answer of course is, is, is they are two separate things. Uh, so you, you still have your database for in, inside financials, in, in sales, marketing and, and you still have your SharePoint data, you still, you still have other uh, data sources out there, uh, uh, but, but the common data service is the thing that allows you to glue those things together using things like Power Apps and Flow. Yeah, that makes sense. I got a question for you, Scott, that I hear often. If you're using Dynamics 365, where do you go to see these common data model entities? Yeah. So the thing about common data, common data services is that 
it rather predisposes that presupposes that you actually have a notion of an enterprise schema. So um, whilst you've got things like dynamics having contacts and, and accounts and opportunities, and you've got financials having a similar kind of thing, but additional entities around um, ledgers, etc. Um, there is very little places where the CDS is viewed in its raw form because it is as a service that that is the point of it it is not it doesn't have a user interface for end users because it's a service that you interact with to, to glue these things together so there is no place where you go to see if, as me as a user I would be using the line of business application so I would be using Dynamics 365 I would be using financials or SharePoint or what other whatever other data sources you've integrated to CDS um, and, and through using those line of business applications I would see the effect of CDS but I wouldn't actually be seeing CDS itself now as an administrator I can go into CDS and I can see the entities and I can go and start to download it into Excel and I can edit it etc but but that's not the primary use case of CDS the primary use case of CDS is that conduit so that I can for example I receive an email um, and I can create a, a lead in in Dynamics 365 um, and, and just using flow but that that lead could come in to CDS and then that CDS lead could then be going into Dynamics 365 as well it could go to somewhere else and then I can interact with lots of different serve lots of different line of business applications all using CDS as, as that central service so does, does that answer your question uh, it, it sure does because I've gotten questions at like serum user group meetings and so forth they go well show me where, where's this where's this place live it sounds like it it's there I can see browse to entities and here's where I'm going to send data to and then it's going to be picked up by financials or something along those lines and I was just curious as to how you're explaining that uh, to people um, because I haven't had a good explanation for it quite frankly up to this point yeah well of course um, power apps is the sort of the um, the closest there is to surfacing CDS because Power Apps is so intrinsically linked to CDS in the sense it's the same part of the same uh, tenant infrastructure, etc. So it's certainly easy to query CDS through Power Apps and say bring up a list of accounts and allow me to interact and, and edit that data. Um, so if, if 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 I was to nominate a native UI, if you like, for CDF, CDS, I think it would be Power Apps. And, and that, of course, is why Power Apps is in the same sort of UI as, as CDS in the sense that they are kind of often bundled together in the same place. Um, and it's, it's the same goes for Flow as well. I, I think you know the, these things are services that interact with uh, CDS in a very native fashion. Gotcha. Okay, cool. I hope that helps people that might might be on the call. Yeah. And, and I think we are. I think it's important to say up front and early on in this conversation that we are early on in the journey of of CDS. Um, we we really only just come out of preview, uh, and we are we have a vision. So Dynamics three sixty five itself is is a vision. It's a it's a long term thing. It's it's not something where we are we've achieved everything now. I mean because. You know, we we all need to have a vision of where we're going to. Otherwise, it would be really boring, right? Um, and so, I think the vision for CDS is is that it is going to allow us to to have a much more enterprise view of how we integrate all these different uh, heterogeneous systems and data sources together in in a way which is core and central to the. Office 365 and Dynamics 365 platform, um, rather than having to have some other thing bolted on the side to, to, to manage that enterprise interchange of data. And, and one of the interesting things that we're starting to see it is also is the policies around data because, and for me this is one of the most interesting things, is because by, by centralizing CDS, uh, you, you can then start to say, well, 
if we have a consistent way of inter interacting with CDS and heterogeneous data sources, that means we can have a central approach to policies to say, well, these two different types of data can't be mixed. So I could say, well, I'm not going to allow um, some a, a flow, for example, to take some data from Dynamics 365 and then tweet about it, for example. Um, and because you know that 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 is a, an enterprise decision that, that you would say that this is an undesirable thing to allow to have happen. So the policies that sit around CDS is, I think that's one for me. That's one of the most interesting areas um, that that we're going to see start to see because then that really does allow us to have um, the empowerment of and the, the self service of inf information workers, which is really what everything is about these days. It's about empowering people to do great things on their own without relying on a lengthy IT project. But whilst doing that, but also having policies in place to make sure that things um, are, are done in a way which conforms to those, those, uh, those enterprise um, restrictions. Yeah, that's, that's interesting information, Scott, for sure, because, you know, I've actually heard some conversation in the communities around, well, you know, flow is good and power apps is good, but, you know, how are we going to control how people are going to use those, you know, and from my perspective, at a very simple level, um, if people don't have privileges to make these connections, right, through these applications, they can't really do anything anyway, right? Now we are opening, or Microsoft is opening things up a, a, a bit more, right? Because now, you, like you said, you can take certain data from these different places using Power Apps and Flow and maybe expose that into social media, whereas before it wouldn't have been as easy to do it. You can still do it, but it certainly wouldn't have been as easy or automatic, that sort of thing. So that policy discussion is, is an interesting one, and uh, it'll be interesting to see where it goes. I, I, I did like hearing that uh, CDS is now out of officially out of preview, and it's available to everyone. Yes? Yeah, in, in its current form, that's right. Um, but this is the first... This is the really the early days, um, and yeah, I, th I think the the future is really bright where where it's going, um, and, and I think the fact that it has Office 365 and Dynamics 365 evolved together. Um, what's really special for me is we're starting to see a true single sign-on for all these things, um, because in the past we've been able to do various different things, right? So we've been able to use BizTalk or, or whatever, um, or other services like If Then That, Then That. Um, so that there's been services out there that allow you to do kind of similar things. But we're now all starting to see it under the same single sign-on umbrella, the same um, tenant management in terms of users and groups and things like that. And I think that's what's really exciting to me is it's really starting to all knit together um, and, and keep a really um, a consistent view. So is is uh, CDS available uh, as kind of an automatic part of having Dynamics 365 or do people have to sign up separately? How How, how is that working so that people can start engaging with this uh, service? Well, um, CDS comes with power apps. Um, okay. So, you know, that, that, that's the, the key part your subscription uh, that, that enables the CDS, um, and of course, you know, Power Apps is included in in, in the Dynamics 365 SKUs. Um, so yeah, it, it, we can see where this is going. It, it, it starts to become a ubiquitous service um, that, that that can be used in all of these different scenarios. That's great. Hey, we actually do have a question here from the audience. Kurt's asking the question. So is CDS similar? using the web API with an OAuth authentication through Azure AD? Um, so if you are using a, the web API against Dynamics 365, um, then you're going directly to your, your Dynamics database. 
so that that is going to surface your um, you know your your accounts in, in Dynamics 365 and etc. Whereas CDS is doesn't provide you with an API on top of Dynamics 365. It provides you with an, a, a, with an, a way of bringing a central set of data that is much more about um, an enterprise schema across all of your different applications. So hence, integration between financials and, and, and sales, for example. You can imagine a scenario where you create an account in, in financials and that flows through into CRM or vice versa. Um, so I don't think it is the same. Um, but of course, oh, auth authentication, um, the, the key is, is that you're using the same authentication to access Dynamics 365 as you are in CDS. So that, that gives you that single sign-on so that any authentication, so you can secure the CDS using uh, privileges. Um, and so that user that you're assigning those privileges is the same users, the user that single sign-ons against uh, Dynamics 365. So that enables us then to have a much more um, consistent uh, authorization approach across all of these different things. Okay, great. Hopefully, that of course, that does raise that does raise an interesting question, which is, can you query the CDS using something like Web API? Um, and and, and Web, Web API is obviously I'm using that in a general sense rather than a specific, you know, because also we've got the Web API in Dynamics 365, right? But but Web API is a much more general concept. It's, it's you know we're saying it's like a RESTful way, an endpoint. Um, and to my knowledge, at this time, there is no way of actually, there is no API other than through Flow and Power Apps, those, the, those connectors. Um, yeah, to I, agree with you. I agree with you, Scott. I don't know a way to be able to do that today. Um, I think that they're looking at expanding that to look at opening up Web API, but uh, it's certainly on the horizon. It's not something today. When you sign up for the apps, you get your authentication from the Office 365 portal. As long as you're connected to that, you'll be able to use and consume some of that data as a resource through your Power Apps or your other items, but uh, there's no direct way today to connect there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Obviously, there is something there because you can flow and Power Apps have got these data connectors and uh, that, that, uh, that do have that ability. Now, as my understanding is at, this mo at the moment in time, Microsoft Graph will be, I think, the, the probably the, the key way of interacting with it because Microsoft Graph is quickly becoming that I think they call it one API to rule them all right um, so uh, I, and, and I know that that uh, CDS is on the roadmap for Microsoft Graph it's but it's, it's not there but Microsoft Graph is quickly expanding to become like why would you go anywhere other than Microsoft Graph because you can get all of your user information all your SharePoint information you know all all, all of these all these kind of rich APIs, they're all bundled up into a single API. Um, so, yeah, I think I think the, the future is great there, but I, I, you know, as actually what comes first, a direct API to CDS or a web, um, a Microsoft Graph API, I, you know, your guess is good as mine. Uh, I would love to see how that would work out with uh, pulling Great Plains information back and forth between CRM and Great Plains, since in the southwest here, uh, all of a sudden, Great Plains has really popped up as being really popular. So uh, there's a lot of demand for that, and the Great Plains MVPs are having some big conversations about this. Yeah, yeah. Well, of course, that that's one of the great things about CDS is that because it because it's this it's a central service that you can then start plugging things into um, as long as there's an adapter that you can use. Uh, to, to talk to Great Plains through either a, a, a native Great Plains flow adapter or, or just using um, the other mechanisms like either a, just a, a REST endpoint or you could you know you can create your own kind of custom bridge if you like um, but yeah absolutely it would become then downstream it wouldn't matter where that data comes from it could come from Great Plains or Dynamics 365 Financials or, or wherever. Um, but the, the, the point is, is, once it's in CDS, it's then in a format which is um, 
So in, in my BizDorp days, we used to call it a canonical data uh, format. So it's like a, a consistent schema that, that everyone understands. And then yeah. once it's there, it, you can talk to everything. I would also I also wouldn't say that there's a tr tremendous interest in GP in regards to it being a new product or anything like that. There are a lot of companies that use Dynamics GP. However, we've started to see some of the writing on the wall with uh, Business Financials Edition, the adapters to move SL and GP customers into financials. Now, not all the functionality that GP has is there today, but clearly I think that's the, their roadmap is to bring those services online for the customer base. You've you got to look at it as we had our first CRM online customers, right? We had these small 10, 15 user seat deals that could get started right away, zero hardware, uh, up, spin up a trial and ready to go. I think you'll see the same thing coming with the financials and working with those GP customers to help them move to new technologies. I'm not saying GP's dead. I'm not saying they're not going to continue investing in it, but uh, based on Microsoft's pattern of what they're doing with cloud-based apps and where we're focused, unless they plan to rewrite GP to run in the cloud or you use a private cloud like Concerto, uh, your options are limited. So that's an interesting question, Gustav, for you. I, you're in, are you in Sweden? Is that correct? I always want to think you're in Sweden. Yeah, it is. Uh, or, or, uh, from a political perspective, I'm in Stockholm, Norway today. Norway. But otherwise, I'm in Sweden. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So, so how do uh, people in your area of the world um, manage? Uh, what type of financial applications are they using? And those people that are using Dynamics 365, are they starting to think about common data service and, you know, how they want to connect and interact with their data? Well, yeah, the, well, the common ERP systems here are um, the smaller companies. Are quite, the NAV is quite popular. Uh, there's a lot of, lot of companies are using NAV. Uh, currently, financials hasn't really been rolled out properly here yet. We're still looking at it probably be, probably being rolled out in uh, Q in Q3 Q4 of uh, 2017. So so this year, but later this year. So it hasn't come come out here yet. Um, so but we'll we'll see uh, when that when when it's coming. Um, some Microsoft people are so sort of smiling about that still. So we're when we're talking about the time time plan roadmaps for that. Um, so the I think the the, the Due to the fact that the financials and the um, and the operations parts haven't really gone online properly here yet, the common data service hasn't really been interest that that interesting yet. But I think I mean still the the, the concepts are still very quite interesting. And then the as a as a from a from a conceptual perspective, but as as Scott is saying, I mean it's still. It's still a very very early product, and I think people are quite um, they don't want to jump be 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 the early adopters of this kind of technology. And then many many businesses here are already have hub based technology uh, integration uh, architecture, like Bitstock, for instance, or something something similar, and um, or they have point to point integrations for their ERP systems already. And trying to change that will cost a lot of money and do it, changing integration architecture is, isn't that sexy, <laughs> yeah. and uh, you should put them put that money somewhere else and doing something more fun with that money. Um, <laughs> so that's usually the problem. Trying to tell them, well, you know, invest invest a lot of money with a return of investment of about five years, and maybe that's uh, um, you. It's not very doesn't you can't see anything on the on the outside of the systems when doing this. So it's. But it's, uh, I think that I think it's from a from a from a general perspective. I think it's a it's it's a good it's a good way. And uh, I had a question for for Scott there because I was working a bit with with both with uh, with a, one of the larger Swedish companies here, and they had their own canon canonical data model which they had designed, which was extremely abstract with you know like parties as a very abstract concept which uh, which they had in the base. And uh, we had sort of like tried to adopt the CRM system to that the very abstract data model and. Which is very complicated in itself, and I can just imagine that if you if you came with this common data service, common data model, 
concept to them, they would say, well, we you know we have our own canonical, canonical data model. Can you have to adapt to this? Please, please just insert our model into this. Um, and the similar thing is for, for many telecom uh, com, uh, operators. They have, they have, they have this uh, telecom forum uh, where they have, they have defined a data model called SID. Um, I don't know if you're aware of that, Scott, but um, many, so, so when you come to, to a telecom operator uh, like Verizon or something, they're probably you already uh, adopting this SID model. And um, it's also extremely abstract uh, and complicated to work with from a, con from a, from a, like a pragmatic perspective. And, and I'm, um, I, I can't say that I'm, I'm really happy to work with it. It's very hard to sort of integrate to other systems using this model. But, uh, well, sometimes you have to anyway. <laughs> Uh, yeah. But what's, what's your perspective on that, Scott, when, sort of, when you want to, if somebody says, like, okay, so we have this model, please insert it into your system, uh, or insert, insert it into the common data service, um, would, would yeah. that, is that? Well, I, I, firstly, I'll say that this is my opinion, and it's not, it's not a reflection on necessarily of the, of the vision from Microsoft, but as I understand it at the moment, I think pragmatic is probably the key word that you used there, Gustav. Um, because one thing that CDS and Flow and, and Power Apps is, is it's pragmatic. It's, so, and I think we are seeing a paradigm shift in the way where these services start to make empowering end users, power users, uh, information workers is, is really the key here. So in the past with, with a product like BizTalk or, or you know, WebSphere or any of these other large ESB providers or, or hub um, message brokers, it, it, it has been very much about taking a step back and a, and a really solid enterprise architecture whereby you have enterprise governance boards. Um, and everything has to go through a very rigorous integration review, and and everything is is uh, is, is sort of locked down, and, and, and these things can take a lot of time. And and I don't think, and again, this is my opinion, but I don't think CDS is something to replace that. Um, CDS, I think, is more an evolution of this, the evolution that we've seen from the likes of Power BI, for example, which is all about self-service BI. There being uh, the ability to very quickly get a mashup and, and a data model that can be then played with and, um, and changed in, by power users and, um, and information workers. So I think CDS and Power Apps is, is following in those footsteps. It's, it's very much about saying, well, okay, if we need to do an integration between some different systems, perhaps we don't need this very, very expensive, time-consuming enterprise architecture perhaps we can be more pragmatic about it and create a CDS store and and start creating some uh, creating our own canonical schema that is for the, the sole purposes of achieving what we want to achieve yeah so um, I think that the 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 concept of biz talk and things like that I think they're, they're still valid and, and especially for you know large financial institutions and things like that I, I, don't, I don't see that going away anytime soon but this does open up new options, and I think that's the thing to that's the thing that we should be looking at here as well. What opportunities does CDS and Power Apps and Flow give us that before would have taken a, a, a great deal of effort in terms of governing and, and making sure that the, the policies were in place so that only the right people could access the right data? Yeah, yeah okay. good point, Jeff. So, Gus, do you think, for instance, that schema that they have that they're developing, that they have in place now, is very similar where they're using like the the EDI model for internet international trade and based on those documents? Because if you ever done a, if you ever done international trade, say for a large company that does business all over the world, they have to use that model for all the different documents uh, that are involved in trade. So we know that it's, that schema exists already. It's all been decided by the UN years ago keeps on being tweaked. So just what Scott said, wouldn't it make sense to Microsoft try to replace that, but to initiate an easier way to make things happen by, say, uh, a, a power user, rather than having to get into the schema and start coding with the, with the EDI model. 
I mean, that makes so much more sense. But do are they what is that what they're using there? With talking about Gus? I think I think that the, the, the EDI model or e, sort of EDI evolution is something that's coming from the other direction because I, if you compare the EDI to to the um, to the SID model, I think the EDI uh, they I mean that's, that's exactly what you mentioned is that they sort of build on top of things and they sort of like a quilt and uh, they sort of just sort of like expanded it and it's uh, the the the, uh, the SID model is something that's like an Extremely academic, abstract construction, uh, which is, if you look at it and try to understand it, it's sort of, it's just uh, very hard. You don't have account and contact. You have like, oh, there's party, and it's, it's and the party is it's very abstract. And then there's like different versions of party, which are in, with inheritance and in, in like massive levels of inheritance. And it's very, very hard to work with. I think that EDI, they sort of they went the other way around. They sort of they started with EDI in a sort of like a pragmatic way, and then they noticed that oh, we don't, we doesn't, we don't have that. So they add stuff on top of it instead, and um, which is the sort of the, the other way around, going with it instead of sort of going back and re-engineering it um, from from the bottom up. They sort of just added stuff stuff on top. But I'm no EDI expert, so that but that but that's sort of my what I've heard about EDI anyway. I think Scott would know more about because he did this talk as well. <laughs> yes, yeah. Oh, those are the days. <laughs> oh, let's not go back to VizTalk. I probably shouldn't say that. There are still people that use VizTalk, right? So. Well, of course, now it's all it's all very much about the Azure Azure services, like VizTalk services in the cloud, and I think that's that's definitely the next evolution. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that pans out with interactions with the CDS. That's that's probably a, a topic for another day. But it's, I mean, it's interesting. You're talking about you know. Because stuff you're talking about, like the layering and the quilt and patching, and because I think versioning certainly um, in all the projects that I do with with uh, you know enterprise integration and enterprise architecture, versioning is one of the most hardest things to get right. Because whilst it's very easy to find a schema and then have different systems interact with that schema. Like you say, you know, so somebody says, "Oh well, well, we need. Well, what about this piece of information? We don't have anywhere to put that information." So you can go and very easily add it to your schema, but then suddenly you've got a bit of a challenge because you've still got existing integrations that don't have any knowledge of that schema. Um, and so versioning, versioning, then and now allows you to start to do that to say, "Well, we're communicating with this version of this endpoint using this schema version X Y Z," um, and certainly. CDS doesn't have anything like that at this time, and I think that is an example of how we are in early days. We, we you know, as this thing matures, these things are going to become um, more important. Now, of course, versioning is, is you know, taking the analogy back to Dynamics 365 and, and the history of that. Right, versioning of of solutions is a classic case. Versioning of solutions didn't really have was wasn't really a big deal back in the day, but now. As the schema has now really had a lot of flux, a lot of changing, and with managed solutions and things like that, there, there is more of an importance about saying, well, when or what version was this particular thing introduced? Um, and that becomes now a really important thing that you consider when you're looking at things. Well, I'm talking to this version, therefore I know that this particular attribute wasn't in, in, uh, introduced until this version, therefore I'm not going to get it. Um, so I think as, as any product matures, by very nature of that maturation process, it has to start handling versioning. So I think we'll probably say the same in CDS. So those are some interesting discussions, Jerry. It looks like you have something that you wanted to add. Yeah, yeah I've got a question, and, and I'm going to pose a business question, part technology, but mostly business question, to my peers on the panel here. I think it'll be of interest to both partners that are listening and end user customers that are listening either now or in the future. So consider the scenario, you're a CRM partner, you're working with your customer running CRM, they have, they're running an accounting system, and now they go, hey, we'd like to integrate the two. So typically in the past this would require the implementation of some third party system that you go out and purchase. And there may be a defined lead organization, maybe it's the 
partner that runs manages the accounting system takes the primary role. Maybe it's a CRM partner takes the role. But let's consider the situation where the CRM partner, for example, doesn't do financials, only does CRM. Does the new model with common data model, common data service, does that change the equation? Who should be the lead organization in the integration between financials and CRM in the common data service environment? Should it be the partner that handles and supports the financial system or should be the CRM partner? So can I take the first stab at it? I was thinking of you, Chris, when I asked the question because you guys have been doing this for a while. I have an so, opinion on this too, but you go ahead, Chris. <laughs> so look, Dynamics 365 is going to change how partners work, no doubt about it. We already have seen that from early August. When it comes to a unique system that's already built between an ERP and a CRM deployment working together, there's going to be the need to integrate not only in your sales process, your pre-sales process, your delivery teams, and your implementations because customers are looking at it as one product. You know, if you go back and look at what was the number one thing Salesforce used to use against selling against Dynamic CRM was the fact that the products weren't integrated. So now we wipe that away, say, okay, the products are now integrated. That's great. Are your teams integrated? Do your teams work together? Do they understand? Do they follow the same? Does your CRM practice and your AX practice follow the same methodology? to make that happen, right? Those are the those are the new challenges of the partner of the future, as uh, Satya says, on, on making those changes. Now, I kind of feel bad for the guys who have CRM partners only because this is going to open up another whole door for that, you're, you know, people are going to say, well, wait a second, you only do the one piece? Don't you do the whole Dynamics 365? And it's even going to change all of us, right? We're going to be more involved in these other tool sets, understanding AX, I mean, you already see it today with how we're all focused on Azure and Power Apps and Power BI. So let's just add AX on top of it, right? Uh, all these things are added on, and the world and landscape as we know it has definitely been changed. Yep. That's and to opinion. add to that, all good points, all valid points. To add to that, from my perspective, I've worked with a lot of, well, I've worked with some companies who, you know, they already have financial systems, right? Whether it's AX or GP or, you know, whatever, NAV. I think uh, Gustav mentioned uh, NAV as well. And, and, and they already have or they have set up or gone through the effort of determining what's going to be the master data, right? So really it's a business decision from my perspective. Businesses are going to have to say, okay, which one's going to be the master, right? Because you 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 never want uh, systems where you know everybody's the master and we're just exchanging data back and forth. So businesses generally, it's been my experience, businesses generally decide that their financial systems have to be the master. Um, primarily, a lot of it can just be around regulatory uh, issues that are associated with those financial financial uh, financial applications. But that's not to say that every business would, and it's a good point, Jerry, and it's a, it's a great discussion point. I like to have these kinds of discussions with customers. And then and, and basically I just tell them, look, you have to make a decision what's right for your company. Most people say the financial system is the master data, you know, and then that means that you have to control, you know, what goes in to your financial applications when you do these integrations, whether it's through the common data service, whether it's through Kingsway Soft, um, Scribe, or any other integration type uh, platform, and 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 then so so when you have this data warehouse, right? It you have to you have to manage that data warehouse. And sometimes when I think about the common data service, right? The common data service slash common data uh, model. I think about data warehousing because now I see that with Dynamics 365, we now have the ability, Dynamics 365 online, we now have a great solution, right? From my perspective, and this could be simplifying it, but from my perspective, we now have this great solution for uh, data warehouse, right? 
before we used to talk to customers or clients about, oh, okay, well, we'll pull your data down from Dynamics 365 and we'll put it in some data warehouse that you have, you know, in your environment and we'll, you know, exchange your financial data with it and we'll integrate all these other sources and then you have your reporting tool. But, 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 but now, you know, we're going to have that with, from my perspective, common data service, and, and each business is going to have to make a decision about what is going to be, who's going to be the master, and they're going to have to ensure that their uh, common data service or whatever data warehouse or wherever they exchange data through whichever applications adheres to those rules. Yeah. Uh, and, and just to compete, just to add to Donna's point, sorry, Scott, when you ask about competing between the two, uh, or deciding which one that is no different where we are in the past to where we are in the future. You must always decide that. Doesn't matter if you're on prem in a cloud where you've been. That was a, always been a problem. Is who is the customer master and how do you determine it? I think it's just more exposed now. Scott, your floor. Yeah, absolutely, Chris. I mean, I think that that is a, a universal truth that um, the technology changes, but the challenges don't. Uh, you know the, these these challenges have been around since day one of anybody doing anything. You know even filing cabinets, right? If, if you've got two departments with two different filing cabinets and they've got customer data, you have to decide how you're going to make sure that those two filing cabinets are kept in sync. Um, but and I, and I think that it's important to position CDS um, with that in mind. You know, I, probably should have said this earlier in that there are obviously two types of integration there are there is data integration which is about what's the master where you've got updates flowing through and making sure that you've got integrity but then there's there's also a kind of like a, a much more application integration approach where it's not purely about the data or an ETL and all those kind of things it's about much more about event. Um, so my analogy about having two different offices with their own filing cabinets, um, you in a data integration world, you have a you have a clerk that's furiously looking at one file and go, oh look, they've changed this and then running over to the other office and then updating the file in the other and oh look they've changed that and then they go run back and then they update that filing cabinet. So that's the kind of data integration. But in a more of an application integration, it's where, okay, well, I have got my file in my, in my filing cabinet, I take the file out, I perform some action, stamp my seal of approval, and I put it in my outbox. And then the clerk goes and picks up, oh, there's something in the outbox, so then he takes it over and drops it at the inbox of the other office, and they take it in, and then they do something, um, and as a product of that, they put something in their outbox. So I think that the, the flow mentality is much more about process application integration rather than, um, Donna, you mentioned like Kingsway Soft. And I, I, in fact, that is very much, although it can be used in, a, in an application integration kind of way, um, it, it tends to be more, used more in the data integration uh, way, in the same way as um, Stripe, I think. Whereas BizTalk, of course, is much, much more about that application. It's about event-driven. Um, and, then, and, and, and I think certainly in my days of working with BizTalk, I think the challenges and the, the projects that were probably the most challenging were the ones where we used BizTalk to kind of do data integration because that, that did result in an awful lot of engineering and a lot of moving around and possibilities of things colliding and, you know, and, 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 and having to reconcile differences and things like that. So I think it's important to position CDS in that application integration uh, part of the, of, of the problem, which is why, of course, at the moment, for example, you can't take an event from Dynamics, a contact is updated or a, 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 an account is updated. You can only take a, an account is created and then bring that into the CDS and then go and do something with it. And I think that's no surprise because it's coming from that event-driven uh, application integration way. Uh, and so it'll be interesting to see how this evolves, to see how they solve that problem of 
well, how do we position this where it can deal with things that need a degree of data integration, but it doesn't get down to that kind of Kingsway soft SSIS type stuff? Uh, I'm not one of the medics, but I think I would like to give a new name to what Scott was talking about. Process integration, where it's not just workflow, but this fires all processes. And concerning what Jerry was bringing up, you know, I started with um, CRM and Great Plains um, pretty much at the same time, at 1.0. So all the projects included both of those, Jerry. And the first thing I noticed in every one of those projects was that this was an opportunity to give a good long look-see at all the processes in the company. And the CRM side was just an extension of the processes that were done in the ERP software. Um, so um, the, the thing that was left out with, uh, with all the ERP software was all the information to continue to generate re revenue. Uh, it was more or less a, a, um, a, uh, a repository of what has happened, what is happening, rather than what may happen, or how can we get something to happen. So those processes were not joined together. And what Scott was bringing out is that um, with the CDS, you could get these processes to more complement with one another, rather than just data integration or workflow. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think it's clear from what we're talking about here that um, unlike Microsoft Graph, which is one API to rule them all, I think it's clear that there is not one integration solution to, it, to rule them all. Um, I think by very nature of integration, I think we, we have to accept that there are going to be different pieces of technology that, that fit better, and it's not going to be a case of choosing one for everything. Like, we're not going to pick BizTalk to do everything. We're not going to pick CDS to do everything. We're not going to pick SSIS or Scribe to do everything. You know, the, these things, um, you have to pick the, the thing that really is at the sweet spot of what you're trying to achieve. Um, I mean, there's obviously uh, the whole process automation and, and process integration. You've got things like K2 Black Pearl, and, you know, things that are, are a much, much more complex where you've got users interacting with your workflows. And the CDS doesn't do that. Again, you know, CDS is purely about that data at rest so that you can then use flow and power apps on top of that. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think it's, uh, it's about self-service. Um, at the moment anyway. Yeah. So, yeah. And that's a great segue into Power Apps. I know we have just a few minutes left, but I did want to take a little bit of time and understand what um, I know Jerry, for instance, and possibly some of the others on the panel, they've been doing some pretty interesting things with Power Apps and possibly Flow. So I wanted to hear a little bit about what you've been doing with those applications. Sure, sure. So in reality, I've actually backed off activities in Power Apps, and I'm just as a sideline activity hobby, so to speak. Um, I've been focusing on Flow. Flow has got enough going on on its own to be just a stand standalone um, area to become pretty knowledgeable and experienced in. Uh, it doesn't have to be lumped together with Power Apps all the time. It, it generally is because the audience is the same in, se in the sense that it appeals to non-developers, although in both cases you need to have some sort of coding affinity to, to really make it work or certainly handle the, uh, the, the, some of the error messages that come out. But I'm looking over here on my other screen here and, and fl on the uh, Flow blog and they've just announced a admin center this week and they've announced that they're up to 100 services they're connecting to. They've got uh, uh, Basecamp and uh, is one of them that they just added, Basecamp 2. So there's just so much going on with Flow uh, in terms of integration between Dynamics 365 and other services that it's just, it can keep you busy by itself. So do you ever, at some point in time, or maybe even now, see Flow replacing some of these other integration type tools like Scribe? So I, I, I had a webinar that I did on um, a week and a half ago with 
in conjunction with MS Dynamics World. And that was one of the questions that was asked by several people. I do not see at this point in time flow replacing and serving as a enterprise integration tool for a variety of reasons. One is it's relatively expensive to run in terms of the number of interactions that would occur in your allotment, so to speak, that you that you that you buy into. Uh, that's one thing. The second thing is is that the there's no sophisticated or even to a certain extent rudimentary error handling. You have to go to the flow interface, log in and see why the flow failed. There's no capability to say, oh, we grabbed this record, we tried to stuff it into CRM, and for whatever reason, we grabbed a field that should have been an email address, but somebody had put a website URL into it, and we just tried to put it into an email field in CRM and it failed, let's write that to a exception report record. Flow doesn't have that. It's a lightweight um, capability. It's maturing. Flow is supposed to re replace, Microsoft Flow is supposed to replace SharePoint workflow. There's no mention of it trying to replace CRM or Dynamics 365 built-in workflow. But I don't see, if I'm Kingsway Soft or Scribe or Cozy Rock or somebody else like that, or just a developer writing an integration using the API, I don't see Flow ready to replace that today or even within this calendar year, for example. It's just not there yet. So in a, in a real business type scenario, how do you see people leveraging Flow today? whether that's consultants or, you know, power users. Right. So I see the people using this on certainly a very personal basis. Uh, it came up on a discussion list the other day. One of fellow MVPs wanted to create a wonderless task for every activity in CRM that was assigned to them. So that's one example. Another example, if I want to start tracking Twitter posts for my specific clients that are out there tweeting, I could use Flow to do that rather than hook, you know, engaging in Microsoft social engagement and, and trying to spin this up. So I see you in use in a lot of lighter weight and personal levels from an enterprise level application. I think there are some things that you could do there. I gave an example for uh, instance where a record is created in CRM, a notification goes out to a person via email, within the email they can click approve or deny, yes or no, and without going back into CRM by that human being, it automatically updates the status of the record. So those are pretty cool things to do, powerful, but I, and you can use it with the common data service, but I don't see this as um, replacing an enterprise class in a integration. So that's an interesting scenario, though. That's that 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 seems like it'd be a real world uh, situation where somebody might, you know, leverage might really want to consider leveraging flow because we get a lot of uh, approval process type workflows, right, in Dynamics CRM where somebody has right. to submit, you know, let's say a case, for instance. Uh, before they resolve it, they need to submit it to somebody to review it, you know, or review a contract or whatever. So sure. in that scenario, you're saying that they could leverage flow and have that email go out to that manager, yes. that approval person. That person could see all the information that they need to see directly from within the email, um, hit some link. Uh, some link within that email and it would automatically go back and approve or not approve or take some other action on that record in Dynamic CRM. Absolutely. You could send an email out to a customer after the close of a case. It could have two buttons in the email, uh, loved you, hated you. <laughs> they click on one and it automatically updates CRM. It, we use it internally here. Uh, I get emails when my team members go into our time card system and want to request a day off, I get an email. I don't have to leave what I'm doing. I don't have to log into our CRM system. Not that I don't log into it every day, but I may already be logged into a client's CRM system, and then I go to log into the 
our CRM system in the same browser tab, a different browser tab, and it says I'm not a member and I got to log out. So I get an email and I can say approved or denied. That's another example. Uh, they're just um, you know, classic example we've done many times where a opportunity is created and the customer wants a price adjustment and the salesperson can't move on to the next phase in the stage until it's been approved by the manager. We've set that up for a client where they're, the manager's getting a approval request by email, yes or no, they can do it from their phone, it has the initial quote, it has the revised number they're looking for, and they can either approve or deny, and the manager can do this without having to log into CRM. It's pretty slick. There's just really only limited by your imagination. There's a lot of cool stuff out there. You wouldn't use Kingsway or any of these other tools to do it, but in terms of getting data from one system to another, it's great. And the flow team has built all the magic for you. That's great. Well, guys, this time always flies for me, but I want to be respectful. I know you guys have other appointments and things to do, and we're all busy. But I just want to take a moment and thank you for your time today. We're at the top of the hour. Um, I can give everybody one minute. Tell me what you're most excited about with Dynamics 365 right now. Scott? Uh, one minute. I can't one tell minute. you in just one <laughs> Got to do it in a minute or less. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, think, I think for me it is, it is that vision of something that is app-based uh, with under a single umbrella, single sign-on, but under the covers you've got integration to so many different uh, data sources. I think that, for me, that's what's so so exciting is that in the past we've had lots and lots of different things um, where you have to have separate sign-on, separate different user interfaces, but I think with Dynamics 365 we're really starting to see these things really come together. And so from a user's perspective, it's not only looking great, but it's also looking consistent. I think that's what's exciting for me. Gustav. Yeah, well, I, I'll just repeat what I said before. I, I was really surprised when I was been showing the mobile app for well, 8.2 yeah. to some of my customers. And uh, I was just sort of, when I, I did a demo for it, and I, just, I, I, I really, they, they really, so they, they don't want to use <laughs> ordinary CRM because they really like the UI, they really like the, the, the feel of it, the speed of it. And I think that this is going to, uh, I think it's showing, it's showing us the future. And I, I think that's a good future. Great. Hey, Jerry. I like it. Well, I like editable grids, I guess, period. That's, <laughs> clients like it, love it, and it's just wonderful. That is a huge productivity boost. And me, I like that we have, we have, a, we have a, 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 a tool chest full of just about everything that we need and can think of needing. Uh, to offer our clients out-of-the-box type solutions, right? It's amazing how much we have. But I'm really primarily really extra excited about all of the relationship insights and uh, the data that uh, is automatically gathered from a variety of different sources and served up to the um, consumers of that data so that they can start taking intelligent actions against that and interactions with their customers. I think we're really coming into this whole new era of leveraging all this data that we have now and surfacing it for everybody to, to, to use in really interesting ways. And the relationship assistant in the mobile app and stuff, I mean, that, that, that's, really, that, that's a classic example. Um, using all this richness of data then just presented in a, a way which is snappy, fast, responsive. Um, yeah. yeah, really excited. Yeah. All right, guys. I hope you have a great day. It's, as always, just a pleasure talking with everyone and um, look forward to chatting soon. Thanks for your time. Yeah. Thanks, Donna.